the message, but I may not. But we'll see how, how it goes. Look at verse number one. Psalms 100. Hey, Miss Tanya. Hey, Braxton. Thanks for bringing your mom to church, buddy. I appreciate it. All right. Look at verse number one. It says this. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness, answer me. And in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as thou that hast been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands upon thee. My soul thirsteth after thee. As a thirsty land, Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, and for thy righteousness' sake bring my soul out of trouble, and of thy mercy cut off mine enemies, and destroy all them that afflict my soul. For I am thy servant. Today I'd like to speak to you on this subject. This is prayer part 14. For a little over three months now, we've been spending every Sunday morning talking about the very important topic of prayer. For anybody that thinks 14 sermons, haven't you talked enough about prayer yet? And uh, prayer is such a cornerstone of the Christian life. I could spend a whole year teaching on prayer, and there'd still be more to talk about. But today, I'm going to talk about this topic, the very last phrase in verse number 12. David said, for I am thy servant. That's the title of my message. And we're going to talk about that for the next 35, 40, 45 minutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. I love you, Jesus. I'm so thrilled to be the pastor of this church. Thank you, Lord. I, I cannot imagine my life not being a pastor. And I count it an honor and a privilege to represent you to these dear people. And so, Lord, in order for me to do it properly, I need your Holy Spirit's power. I need the mind of Christ. Help me to say exactly what you once said. Bless every person who's here. Help them to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, if there's anybody among us that needs to be saved, if anybody who needs to be baptized, Lord, would you please help them to make those important decisions today. But Lord, touch all of our hearts, change all of our lives, and we'll give you glory for what you'll do. Please bless America. Give us revival. Help us to come out of this deadness that we have when it comes to spiritual deadness. Please give us a, um, a spiritual awakening like we've never known before. And we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. For I am thy servant. Psalm 143 is a prayer of David. In verse number one, David says, hear my prayer. And this whole chapter is written down in the scriptures what David prayed about. And when you get down to the conclusion of the prayer, we see why David was praying and the reason he was going to give God to answer his prayer. He said, for I am thy servant. You know, often when we pray in our American culture, and the way we pray, we, and I do this, and it's not bad. It's just not necessary. 
But we often say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Or, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And, and, and that's okay. That's, that's not necessarily wrong. But in the Bible, people didn't pray that way. It's just a, a cultural prayer way that we pray uh, in America. But here's how David concluded his prayer. He said, for I am thy servant. I want to point out some things right now before, by way of introduction. David was saying, Lord, I want you to hear my prayer because I'm your servant. He didn't say, Lord, hear my prayer because I'm the king of Israel. You look at my title, God. I'm special. I'm the, I'm the one that every, I mean, I'm the king of your people. And so, Lord, would you please hear my prayer because I'm the king of Israel. He did not say that. He did not say, Lord, would you hear this prayer of mine because you love me. Well, how many people in the world does God love? He loves everybody. But he doesn't hear everybody's prayer. Every once in a while, somebody tries to be a little bit, you know, uh, <laughs> I know more about the Bible than you do, Pastor. <laughs> God hears every prayer. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. I could show you verse after verse after verse where God says, I'm not hearing your prayer. Don't even bother praying. So uh, sometimes people say, well, God hears every prayer. He just sometimes says no. No, sometimes he says no to even hearing the prayer. <laughs> and so the Bible tells us our iniquity sometimes can prevent us from getting our prayers answered. And God won't even hear us because we refuse to get right with him. Or maybe the Bible says the wicked are far from me. I will not hear them. Someone who lives in a wicked lifestyle, who has no, no desire of repentance at all getting right with God God's like man you're don't even bother talking to me you're way on the other end of the spectrum if you please and um, so David did not say hear my prayer because I'm the king of Israel he did not say hear my prayer because you love me then he did not say hear my prayer because I'm your child he didn't say that God doesn't hear all of his children's prayers Every once in a while, people are, are so, uh, they believe so much contemporary theology, they don't even know that their theology doesn't match up with the Bible. Have you ever heard someone say, we're all God's children? That's, that's, that's not true. We are not all God's children. We are all God's creation. God created every one of us. But you do not become a child of God until you have a spiritual birth. Until you get born again, until you get birthed into the family of God. And that happens at the moment of your salvation. When you get saved, you become a son or a daughter of God. But you're not God's child until you get saved. Once you get saved, you become God's child. But God, uh, David did not say, God, hear my prayer because I'm your child. He didn't say that. He simply said this, Lord, for I am thy child servant. Now, what does the word servant mean? It has three meanings. Let me give them to you right now. The word servant means of servitude and subjection. So the first meaning of the word servant is David said, Lord, I have subjected myself to you. You're my superior. I am your subordinate. I have subjected myself to you. The second meaning of the word servant is this, voluntary bondman. Voluntary bondman. It, it, the word bondman is similar to our word slave. And David said, I volunteer to give you my life as your servant. I am your bondman. Tell me what to do. I'm yours. I belong to you. I do not belong to me. And what that was, though, that relationship with God, being his servant, is it was voluntary. You know, every once in a while, people try to tell me things like, well, I don't feel called to go soul winning. First of all, God doesn't call us to go soul winning. God commands us to go soul winning. But sometimes people say, well, you've got the gift of soul winning, and I don't. You've got the gift. No, 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 no. What, why don't you just volunteer? Why don't you just say, God, I don't feel called to anything specific, but I'm going to volunteer. Here I am, Lord, use me. I'm down here. Tell me what to do. I'm yours. That's what David did. He said, I'm your voluntary bondman. And then the third definition, uh, meaning of the word servant, is this. Acting as a minister for another. The word servant means acting as a minister for another. What David was saying is, God, I'm alive on planet earth, and I am here to help your kingdom fulfill your purpose. I'm here to do whatever you need done. 
Just tell me what you want done. I'm your minister. The word minister is synonymous with the word servant. A lot of times people call pastors ministers. And that's fine. I mean, I'm God's servant, right? I mean, that's appropriate. But, but it's not just for pastors. It's for anybody. It's for moms and dads. It's for teenagers. Uh, it's for children. And um, is it for sisters? I'm not sure if it is. Okay, but maybe. All right, here we go. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's for anybody that wants to make their life count for, for God. And so David said, I'm your servant. I'm acting as a minister on your behalf. He said, what do you need done on planet earth. You tell me, I'll do it for you. I'm your servant. So here David takes a whole chapter. And by the way, David was an awesome man of faith. I mean, there, there's so much about David that we can learn from and uh, what an incredible man of faith, but he prayed and got his prayers answered because he volunteered to be God's servant. Now you can choose to live your life by serving yourself or you can choose to live your life by serving others. The world tells you, look out for yourself. Do what's best for you. Look out for number one and live your, what does the world say? Follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you to. All they're saying is serve yourself, serve yourself. But there's a better way to live. You can live your life by serving others. Now, who are those others? Well, God, family, friends, even strangers. But you can be a servant of others, including God. And that's the best way to live. David was asking God to hear his prayer because he was God's servant. Being God's servant gave weight to David's prayer. It gave weight to it. God, would you hear my prayer? You know, and if you can imagine, God might have said something like this. Why, Ken? Why should I hear your prayer? You say, God wouldn't say that. He would just say, your wish is my command. <laughs> uh, no, God's not a genie that you got to rub out of a lamp. Amen. You know what too many people's prayer relationship is with God? 911. God, I have an emergency. 911. God, would you hear my prayer? All right, well, okay, God may do that for you the first or second time that you have an emergency. But it gets to a point where if all God is to you is 911, then he just simply may not care about answering your prayer if, if that's the relationship you have. But here's what David did. He said, God, I am willing to do whatever you want done. I'm your volunteer bondman. I subject myself to you. You are the superior. I am the subordinate. And you tell me what needs to be done and I'm in. You just tell me what to do. You know, years ago, it's funny how there are different phases, fads, that go through the American society. Do y'all remember WWJD? Y'all remember that? That seems like it was decades ago, man. For those of you that don't know, what, how many of you don't know what WWJD is? There was a time, most of you know, okay. There was a time in Christianity about 30 years ago where people would say things, what would Jesus do? And then they would bring up the initials, WWJD, do what Jesus would do. They would sell bracelets. People would be wearing bracelets, WWJD. They'd have it around their neck on a necklace, WWJD. They would, they would have it on the walls of their house, WWJD. Uh, you know, well, there was another fad that was even before WWJD. And it was this, I, I, I go soul winning every week and often I'll knock on doors, even during COVID. But anyway, I'll uh, knock on doors and try to talk to people about the Lord. And often I used to see a door knocker and they would have a scripture verse from Joshua 24. And it would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have y'all ever seen that on someone's door or on someone's wall in their house? It used to be a real big fad. I mean, it was like a lot of Christians had it. Often I've wanted, I've never done this, but I'd want to knock on the door and I would say, hi, I'm Pastor Sulian from Hopewell Baptist Church. He's out inviting people to come to church. I see your door knocker. What, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can I ask you a question? What exactly do you do to serve the Lord? Because you know what? Most of the time, if they would have been truthful, it should say, as for me and my house, we believe in the Lord. But serving God is something totally different than believing in God. Serving God is doing something for him. Serving God is saying, God, you want me to go to church? 
I'm in every Sunday. I'm not going to miss. I, you know, I'm not going to miss it. You know, just, just to miss to watch a football game or whatever excuse people have. I'm in. I'm here for you. You want me to go tell someone about Jesus? I'll do it. You want me to hand out a gospel track? I'll do it. Is there a bus you want me to work on? I'm a mechanic. I can do that. Or is there a job I can do? Uh, tell me what it is, what you need done. I'm your servant. I want to serve you. I want to do something for you. And David said, God, answer my prayer because I am your servant. So let me help you this this morning to see the value of praying like David prayed and saying, God, I'm going to bring these prayer requests to you. And by the way, would you please answer them because I'm your servant and then really be his servant. There are nine things that David asked for in this passage of scripture that we can learn from as an example that we can ask for them too. If we like David, will say to God, I'm your servant, and actually mean it. Number one, look at verse one. In verse number one of Psalm 143, it says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness, answer me, and in thy righteousness. Number one, write this down. He asked God to hear and answer his prayers. He asked God to hear and answer his prayers. Now, there are two things about that. First of all, I know some people don't like to hear this, but it's true. Sometimes God refuses to hear us when we pray. That's not a good place to be in, by the way. Sometimes I've prayed in the past, and I'll be honest with you, if maybe you can be honest with yourself. Sometimes I prayed in the past, and after I prayed, I felt like the prayer went right up to the ceiling and bounced right back down. Never even made it close to the throne of God. Sometimes when I pray, I feel so far away from God, I don't even know if God's hearing me, you know, sometimes when people pray, it's kind of like the Charlie Brown cartoons from years ago when the, when the adults would talk, it'd just be womp, 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 womp. And I'd be praying to God. And sometimes I felt like my prayers just womp, 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 womp. <laughs> it's, it's just meaningless. It's just, it's just sound with no meaning. But David said, hear my prayer. There are times in our lives, not good times. But there are times when God won't hear our prayers if we're not careful. But David said, hear. And then he said, don't just hear what I'm saying. Answer my prayers. One of the things I've learned, I'm 51 years of age. Welcome to the 51 Club, Keith. I'm 51 years of age. And I, um, you know what? I've got less time to live than I've lived already. I know that. And the last thing I want to do is waste any of my time. So you know what in my book, Wasted Time is? Praying that has no purpose. I'm just going through the motions. I'm just saying the, the repetitions. I'm just, you know, saying these words over and 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 over again. God says about vain repetition, He says, Don't pray like the heathen. They think I'm hearing them because of their much words. But He says, I'm not hearing them. It's just vain repetition. It has no meaning to God. But I don't want to waste my prayer life. I don't want to waste my life, period. I want to pray and have God hear me and have God answer me. And that's exactly what David prayed, first of all. Number two. Look at verse number two now. In verse number two it says, And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight no man living be, uh, uh, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Number two, write this down. He asked God for mercy in judgment. He asked God for mercy. Now you listen to me right now. Here's what David was saying. He, he prayed, said, God, would you hear me and answer my prayers? And by the way, please don't judge me. He said, because if you do stand in judgment with me, I'll be condemned. He said, no man living shall be justified. In your sight. No man including me. You know what David did? He approached God in his prayer and he said, first of all, God, I'd like you to hear me and answer my prayer. But secondly, I want you to know this. I know who I am. I'm just a sinner. I'm not deserving of your grace, but because of your mercy, I can stand before you. Please don't judge me, Lord. Because if you do, I'll be found wanting. I'll be condemned. You know, there are two types of sinners in the world today. There are sinners that... Uh, Oh, okay. Hey, uh, there, there are, there are sin. Oh, thank you, brother. <laughs> I thought I was in trouble. It's walking down the aisle. You're in trouble. This envelope, you don't have enough money in it, preacher. Uh, but anyway. 
<laughs> but uh, there are two types of sinners in the world today. There are sinners, number one, that are in denial. They are unrepentive. They are, I'm not living and I'm doing all, this is nothing wrong with this, all of that. Their second type of sinner are those that are uh, uh, admitting, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy. I, I know I, I, I deserve to be condemned. Please don't judge me. And so what David was saying is, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that. And, and, and please do not stand in judgment of me. Because if you do, no man living will be justified in your sight. You know, God doesn't expect you not to ever sin. He doesn't expect that from us. Here's what he expects you to do. When you do sin, own it. Just simply go to him and say, God, I'm guilty. I'm sorry. I, I have sinned. I'm not pretending I'm all that. I'm not pretending I'm a saint. I'm not pretending, you know, that I'm a perfect Christian. I know who I am. You know, sometimes I don't know how you live your life. But sometimes I live my life and I just wonder, why, God, do you put up with me? I know I must disappoint you so often. I know there are times in my life, I, you, know, I, you know, I know sometimes when I preach, people feel like I follow you around all week long. And then I find out what to preach about by watching your life. No, I don't follow you around. I don't want to know what you do. <laughs> First of all, I don't want to see what you do. Second of all, I hope you don't follow me around all week long because then you'd be discouraged too. <laughs> so, you know, one, one uh, preacher many, many years ago said a preacher is just a sinner trying to help a bunch of sinners not sin. I'm in the same boat as all of you all are. I thank God for God's mercy. I'm so glad that he allows me to be a pastor. But I am not a pastor up here that says, bless God, I deserve to be a pastor. You listen to me. I am all this. And you, you peons, you church members, you, you lower than me people, you listen to me preach. Oh, my soul. <laughs> there are preachers like that in the world. Have you ever met one? <laughs> ever saw one preach? Yeah. Condescending, above everybody, better than everybody. That's not David. David didn't pray by going, oh, God, you know me. Remember, I'm the man after your own heart. <laughs> Would you hear my prayer because I'm such a great person? No, he said, Lord, please don't judge me. He goes, if you do judge me, no man living shall be justified in your sight. I, I'm condemned already. I'm guilty already. Every once in a while, can you believe this? Some of you don't know this happens in churches, but sometimes people get mad at me. And they get so mad that they leave the church. I'm not coming back. I don't like what you did. I tell them, hey, draft the paper. I'll sign it. I agree with you. <laughs> you did wrong. Uh, which time? <laughs> Was that the time I did wrong yesterday or last week? What, what are you mad about this time? Uh, see, you, you don't come to this church because you have a perfect preacher. That's not why you're here. And, and I'm not mad at anybody here that sins. You know why? Because we're all in the same boat. We're just trying to learn and live and grow and, and try to be what God wants us to be. But here's what the devil does. When you sin, he likes to beat you up. He likes to tell you you're worthless. You're good for nothing in the eyes of God. You're a sinner. God doesn't love you. Why even bother praying? Probably, probably the number one reason why people don't pray is they feel guilt and shame about their sins. That's probably the number one reason. Do you know why a lot of people stop going to church? Because they feel guilty for the sins they've committed. Hey, thank God this is a church that I don't care what sins you've committed. If you want to get right with God, you come here. You're welcome here. I, I'll love on you. I'll help you to get right with God. There's mercy from the Lord here at Hopewell. And that's what David was saying. God, I need you to hear my prayers and answer them, but I need your mercy. Because if you were to judge me for everything I've done, oh, I would be wanting, I'd be condemned. How's your attitude when you pray? Do you pray, dear God, answer my prayer. Wait, wait. wait. Dear God, answer my prayer because of who I am. Oh, man, if I ever ask God to answer my, you know, God, would you hear my prayer? I'm the pastor at Hopewell Baptist Church. God might just say, uh, you better be careful. I can always get another. You think you're all that? No, I say, God, I'm just a sinner needing your mercy. And if it wasn't for your mercy, I'd have no right to come before you in prayer.
Number three, uh, the third thing that David asked for is found in verse number seven. In verse number seven, he said, hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like uh, the, unto them that go down into the pit. Number three, David asked God for quick answers. He said, hear me speedily. You know what he was saying? He's like, Lord, I need this answer right now. I need this answer today. I'm going through something today. Next week won't do. Next month won't do. Next year won't do. I need it now. God, hear me speedily. Now, why was he asking God? Because it was something relevant to that day that he needed God's help that day. Last night, we have a you know testimony time in our church like we did this morning. And last night, a lady in our church gave a testimony. She said, I was um, uh, in the midst of making a decision about something today and in my mind I was thinking should I do this or should I do this and she said all of a sudden God showed up in my mind and said do this and I went wow I didn't even have time to ask you yet I was just thinking to myself what am I going to do and God said do this and she said oh thank you God you answered my prayer at that moment without her even actually praying yet God gave her the answer before she even asked you know sometimes God answers our prayers like this Right away. Just like that. Sometimes God doesn't. But in this particular case, David said, Lord, I need my prayer answer today. I need you to tell me what to do right now. Please answer me speedily. The fourth thing that David asked is found in verse number 8. In verse number 8, he said this. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Number four, he asked God for guidance throughout life. He asked God to guide him. He said, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. Now, there are two aspects of that that you need to be aware of. The guidance in life. First of all, the, 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 the first aspect is the overall plan of God for your life. Do you even know what that is? Have you ever found out and figured out why you're on this planet? Do you know some people, they, they think, well, I'm here to spend time with my family. Really? The, the, the reason you're here is because God wanted you to spend time with your family? No, that's not why you're here. You're not here to breathe God's air, to take up space on his dirt, to drink his water and eat his food. That's not why you're here. You know, the Bible says you know, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible says Christ Jesus came into this world, into the world to save sinners. So the reason he was there was to save sinners. The Calvary, that's what it was all about. Now, while he was here, he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he comforted the, the, the distraught, he raised the dead, he opened blind eyes, he opened deaf ears, he preached many sermons, he discipled, you know, 12, 12 apostles, but that's not why he came. Now, he did those things while he was here, but the purpose that he came to earth was to save sinners. What's the purpose you're on this planet? It's not to say you can't do anything else with your life. As long as you have that, this is why I'm here. At age 16, God met me and he told, in my bedroom and he told me he wanted me to be a preacher. And I said, God, what? You want me to be what? You got to be kidding. I thought God was in the wrong house, in the wrong neighborhood, and even in the wrong city. I'm like, God, there's no way I could be a preacher. And he said, yes, you can. I want you to be a preacher. For a solid year, I resisted him. One of the reasons I resisted him was I said, God, I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm going to be the Denver Broncos starting quarterback. Are you laughing at me? I would have done it. They would have drafted me instead of John Elway. And uh, I would have had those Super Bowl trophies. Tom Brady, seven championships, move over, man. I would have had ten. But anyway, uh, but, but my love for sports was surpassing every other love in my life. I, I wanted to go into professional sports, whether it be an athlete or a sports photographer, a sports announcer, a broadcaster, a sports writer. Someone told me years ago I had a great face for radio. And so I... Wait a second. No, wait, no, no. I'm sorry. I had a great voice for radio. And uh, 
you laughed at the other one. Uh, but the thing is, my whole life was going to be around sports. That's what I, that's what my dream was. And God said, that's not why I created you. I didn't create you to throw a football. I didn't create you to follow sports. I created you to be a preacher. So then God guided me, and at age 17, I surrendered and said, okay, everything in my life from age 17 till now has been all focused on the fact that God wants me to be a preacher. But wait a second. The, the second aspect of God's guidance, in verse number 8, it says, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. How does a person walk? Typically. You ready? You take one step at a time. So every step... David was saying, would you, would you guide me? As I follow the overall big plan of God for my life, would you guide each step? So what's that? That means like this. So, so maybe you need to make a decision like where to live. Don't make a decision like where to live on your own. Ask God to guide you. Ask God to guide you with what job to take, like Miss Anna asked today. I've got several offers, and I just simply want to make the right choice. Well, she asked for prayer. Why? She wants God to guide her to the right job. How about, have you ever prayed about what school your kids should go to? Lord, where should my kids get an education? Those of us that have gone to college, do you ever pray, Lord, what college should I go to? Guide my steps. If you're here today and you're single and you want to be married today, the worst thing you can do is marry somebody out of God's will. Ask God to guide you who to marry. Do you realize the second greatest decision you'll ever make, the first greatest is salvation, the second greatest is marriage? Marriage is such a powerful decision in a person's life. But David said, guide my steps, all these decisions I have to make. And I'm not asking you to pray for God to say, what socks should I wear today? Today I opened up the sock drawer and I had my, my, my wife was still in bed at the time. And I, um, I got my uh, cell phone out and, uh, and I put on my, my flashlight and I opened up the sock drawer and I saw about 30 pairs of socks. I picked up that one and said, oh, do I want to, no, no. okay, I'll wear that sock. And I pulled them out and that's what I wore today. You know what? <laughs> this is not necessarily you know, guiding my steps. God, which pair of socks should I wear? I mean, obviously some prayers like that. Now the Bible says casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. I gotta be honest with you. I don't really care what socks I wear. Okay. I mean, that's not like a care. So I don't know if God, you know, I'm not saying guide me to what socks to wear, but I want God to guide me every step of life, every decision I make. I always want those steps to point to the overall big picture that God wants me to do. What is it that you put me on this planet here for? Help me to every decision in life, guide me. And that's what David was asking for. The next thing is found in verse number nine. Uh, the fifth thing in verse number nine, the Bible says this, deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Number five, he was asking God to deliver him from his enemies. David was asking God to deliver him from his enemies. Now, listen to me carefully. If you ever want to do anything in this life for God, you are going to get enemies. You really will. No matter what, if you live for God, the devil's going to be your enemy. And the devil is going to fight you. Some of us, though, we have enemies at work. Have you ever worked a job where someone at that job just caused you grief. I mean, they were like your personal adversary at work. You know what I'm talking about? How about this? Have you ever had an enemy in your neighborhood? I've got one. <laughs> Last year alone, I had a neighbor call the police on me 13 times, all because of my dogs. <laughs> they're either barking too much or they're too much dog poop in my backyard. <laughs> After 13 times, the police officer got called out. They finally said to the woman, look, stop calling the police. We're not giving him a ticket for anything. It used to be that I'd, I'd, I'd always call the police officers after that she did. And uh, if I knew about it, and I'd say, so what'd she say today? <laughs> 
And they, they, but the, here's what she told me. She goes, it got to a point they have caller ID on their phones, right, at the police station, right? So when that number would call and that name would appear, it's the dog poop lady. Are you going to get it? <laughs> They'd answer the phone, and she wanted me thrown in jail or something, arrested, fined, told to move out of my house. I don't know. She's just, like, possessed, you know? I mean, good night, it's dogs, dogs bark, they go to the potty in the backyard, you know? I mean, it's just life, right? But, but man, I've had some adversaries in the neighborhood that I've lived in. People that were like out to get me or just simply wanting to cause me grief. I remember one time there was uh, my first house that I bought. There was a kid across the street joined a gang. And I was a preacher and he just didn't like that idea that I was a preacher. Now, I usually get along with gang members pretty well. They, I give them respect, and they listen to me, and I've led a lot of them to the Lord. But this one particular kid, man, alive. I went, I went out, of vac- out of town on vacation, came back. There was a rock thrown through my window. The car that I left in my driveway had a hammer taken to the back, you know, light. And uh, just a lot of, lot of, just because he didn't like the fact. I think what happened was he was playing his rap music one time outside so loud that it was in the summertime and of course if y'all have ever listened to rap music first of all i don't recommend it secondly like every other word's a cuss word and here i got small boys in my house and there's blank and blank this and blank and blank that and all this music i just went out to him one day and said look man would you would you please just turn it down so i don't have to hear it in my house i think that's what made him mad i don't know why, why would that make anybody mad but anyway um but do you have a neighbor that's your enemy how about this how about a family member I have some family members. They cannot stand me. I've got some family members that we have been button heads for years. I mean, just, I mean, look, I'm a preacher. You, you would think you're the pastor. Everybody in your family adores you and loves you. Oh, really? I wish that were true. <laughs> Become a preacher. Everyone in your family is going to love you. No, I've had some opposition over the years, and it's no fun. How many of you have ever had a situation in your family? Whether it's extended family or in your home, it don't matter. But they, they opposed you, fought you. That's no fun. So here's David. He said, Lord, I've got some enemies. He said, God, would you deliver me from them? You know what he was saying? He goes, hide me. I don't even want to face them. I don't want to fight them. I, I'd rather not have that contention, whether it be the devil or at work or in your neighborhood or in your family. But listen to me. He was saying, God, deliver me. I really don't want to fight. Some people, their whole thing about life is they look for a fight. They want to fight. Others, they'd, they'd rather not fight. And that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, one preacher years ago said this. There are two types of preachers in the world, two types of pastors. One, they want to be in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you don't know what the Fox's Book of Martyrs is, it's a man named Fox, and he wrote a book about Christians who died for the cause of Christ. He said, I got this friend named Lester Roloff. If there was a bullet flying in the air, he'd be jumping at it in front of it, hoping to die for the cause of Christ. There are some people that just live for the battle. They love it, and they'd like to die on the battlefield. He said, not me. He goes, I'd rather be in the Guinness Book of Records, <laughs> not the Fox's Book of Martyrs. He says, I, I'd rather not fight if I don't have to. Now, you listen to me right now. There is nothing in my bones that wants to fight. But I've never run from a fight. I'm not a coward. I'm not just going to lay down and let some enemy walk all over me. I'm not going to let the devil do it. I'm not going to let somebody, a human being do it. And I'm not going to let my government do it if it comes to that. Now, you listen to me right now. I have no idea what the future of America holds with this, you know, administration that we have as the president right now and and, uh, running the show, all the Democrats running all three houses of power, all three branches of power. And you just don't know what's going to happen. I promise you, they're coming after your Second Amendment. They're coming after your free speech. And it won't be long before they come after our religion. You say, this is America. What are you talking about? Listen, stop drinking the Kool-Aid. Every once in a while, can you believe there are people that come to this church? They're not necessarily in this room right now. But there are people that come to this church that are mad at me because I voted for Trump. They're like, but look at all of his tweets. 
And I'm like, I know, I know. He needs to <laughs> not be such a narcissist. He needs to be a little bit more graceful. He needs more of the fruit of the Spirit. He needs to be more of a better uh, Christian role model, maybe. But, but listen to me very carefully. I would much rather have him than have somebody that's going to sell us to the devil and to communism and socialism and cause us to lose all of our freedoms and liberties. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not looking forward to a fight, but if a fight comes, I'm not running. Do you realize there were people in 1776 who said to the king of England and the regime and the power of England, and they said, enough. We are not giving in. This is the line we're drawing in the sand, and we are done. And that's how God birthed us, the greatest nation in this world. Because there were people that just said, we have had enough, and we're not going to lose any more freedoms and any more liberties. Now, it may come to that in America. Do you have enough courage to stand and say, I'm not going to run? Now, David, you know David. He fought Goliath. You know David. He was a man of war. He, he, he won countless numbers of wars and battles. But his heart was, Lord, would you deliver me from this? You know what? I would rather have America get revival. I'd rather have a president and politicians that honor God and love God and love our constitution and love our freedoms and liberties and help to preserve them for us for generations to come. If you say, preacher, do you want to go to war or do you want revival? 100 times I'll choose revival out of 100. I want revival. And that's what David said in the prayer, deliver me from my enemies. But guess what? If, it doesn't, if he doesn't get delivered, he's going to fight. He's going to stand his ground. And that's what we need to do. Whether it's the devil or a person or, you know, God forbid, but our government. I mean, it doesn't matter. See, you, you're, you're talking, this is America. Do you realize every socialistic and communistic country, before they became socialistic and communistic, they probably had citizens that thought it will never happen here. Amen? Oh, listen, let's pray for God to deliver us from that. Let's pray for God to deliver us from the, e the enemy of evil, the enemy that wants to suck away our freedom of God and freedom of speech and uh, freedom of, of, of being able to protect our families and all of that. Number six, look at verse 10. We're almost done. We won't be much longer. Look at verse 10. In verse number 10, it says, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Number six, I wrote this down. He asked God to help him stay in the will of God. He helped him. He asked God to help him to stay in the will of God. In verse 10, it says, teach me to do thy will. Do you know the worst place that you can ever find yourself in? The worst place you can ever find yourself in is outside of the will of God. That's the worst place. It's an old story, but it fits so well. Back in 1994, we started this church in September of 94. In October of 94, we had our charter membership service. The first people to become members of Hopewell Baptist Church. We had about 36 members of our church at that time, that charter members. And we had one family in particular that I had led to Christ, Mama Bear, Papa Bear, and the two baby bears. They all got saved. And then I remember one Saturday, I still remember it to this day. It's amazing how your mind, you don't forget things, but I knocked on their door and I said, hey, just want to see how your week's going. And the man said, oh, it's going great, preacher. Tomorrow's the last day you're going to see us. I went, what? He goes, yep, we got a job offer in New Mexico. We're moving to New Mexico. I said, well, w wait a second, when? He said, two weeks my, my job starts. I got to leave next week and get my family settled. We're out of here. Tomorrow's the last day you're going to see us. I'm like, uh, 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 it, do, do you need advice? I mean, what, did you pray? About, really? You're just gone? <laughs> they left. Uh, all right. About 12 years later, they were passing through Longmont, and they came to church, all four of them. And they said, Pastor, we want to take you out to eat afterwards. They took us to Golden Corral. Do you all remember Golden Corral up there in Longmont, uh, uh, Main Street there? And uh, by where the old, K old uh, Kmart was, <laughs> near there. You all remember the old Kmart? <laughs> Man, all these stores are leaving. JCPenney, my favorite place to go shopping. Jacques Penney. 
Oh, I used to love to buy clothes at Shock Panay. But anyway, uh, but anyway, it took us to Golden uh, Crown. We're sitting there eating across the table. He's sitting there and he said, Preacher, I got to tell you, the worst decision I ever made for my family was to move away in, in 1995 when, when, or, or December of 94. He said, worst decision of my life. I said, why? He said, for four years, we couldn't find a church to go to that was a good church. Four years. We did not go to church. We were out of God's will for four years. He said, finally, my job transferred me to Oklahoma. And he goes, I found a good church to go to down there. And he told me about it. But he said, for four years, I was out of God's will because we moved because of a job, but not because of God. Listen, the worst thing you can do is leave God's will for your life. The worst thing you can do. David said, teach me to do thy will. Next, number seven. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, he said, quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. There are two things he asked for. Number seven, he asked God to revive him. That's what the word quicken means. The word quicken mean, doesn't mean to be quick like, you know, the road runner. Beep, beep. That's not what it's talking about. The word quicken means to take something that was dead and bring life to it. You know what David said? Lord, I need to be revived. That's, that's what revival is. You know what? You say, preacher, when do I need to be revived? Well, probably once or twice, maybe three times a year. You know, you need a shot in the arm. If there's anything, are, are, are you closer to God today than you were ever in the past? Or is there a time in your past that you were closer to God than you are today? Well, you might need revival. You might need God to quicken you. You might need God to come here and give you a shot in the arm. How's your marriage? Is it on the rocks? Is it struggling? Maybe you need God to quicken that marriage. How's your parenting? Oh. <laughs> Do you need God to give you a shot in the arm as a parent with your children? Do you need God to quicken you? Hey, that's what David was saying. Lord, quicken me. There's something in my life that feels dead. It needs life again. God, quicken me. He asked God for it. Then at the last half of that verse, in verse 11, it says, and it says, for thy righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Number eight, there's only nine points, so we're almost done. Number eight, he asked God to bring him out of trouble. He asked God, Lord, bring me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Would you bring me out? There are two types of trouble that you're going to face in this world. You ready? The first type of trouble is from someone else. It's inflicted upon you from an outsider the second kind of trouble is self-inflicted trouble amen you got yourself in trouble we affectionately call that the school of hard knocks how many of you have ever attended the school of hard knocks uh, how many of you have graduated from the school of hard, or hard knocks i have a master's degree from the school of hard knocks Sometimes we're in trouble because someone afflicts us. Sometimes we're in trouble because it's self-afflicted. But you know what God wants to do? He wants to help you in your trouble. He says, come to me, ask me, I'll help you. And that's what David did. He asked him. And then number nine and last, look at verse 12. In verse number 12, it says this. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul. For I and thy servant. The ninth thing that David was asking God to do was this. He asked God to defend him. He said, God, would you defend me? Here's what he said. You know, man, David was so just an incredible man. Incredible man. But here's what he was saying. Look what he said. He said, and of thy mercy cut off mine enemies. You know what that meant? He said, end them. He said, kill them, God. My enemies, God, I'm asking for your mercy in my life. Would you kill them? Cut them off. That's what it means to cut them off. It means to end their life. And then he said, now watch this, and destroy all them that afflict my soul. What he was saying, by the way, destroy. What he was saying is, they've got an agenda. They're trying to hurt me, afflict my soul. He said, would you destroy their agenda? They're coming after me to try to ruin me. He said, God, would you defend me? Would you kill them, cut them off? And then their agenda, would you just destroy it? Just make it turn upon itself. By the way, this is a man after God's own heart. Amen? Amen. So we're, we're talking, you know what he said? God, 
I'd rather not defend myself. Would you please defend me? The last thing you want to do, the last thing anybody on this, in this room should ever want to do is to attack God's servant. When you attack God's servant, you better be careful. God just may defend him. Amen? So here's David, a man after God's own heart. Would you cut off my enemies? Destroy what they're trying to do to me. Now here's what it all is about. David asked God to hear and answer his prayers. He asked God for mercy in judgment. He asked God for quick answers. He asked God for guidance throughout life to deliver him from his enemies. He asked God to help him stay in the will of God. He asked God to revive him, uh, quicken him, make him make what's dead alive again. He asked God to bring him out of trouble and to defend him from his enemies. And then here's the whole reason why. For I am thy servant. God, you know me. I'm not perfect. But I'm your servant. I will do today whatever you tell me to do. What needs to be done? Ask. I'll do it for you. I'm happy. I'm volunteering as a bondman. I am subjecting myself to you. You are the superior. I am your subordinate. And I am desiring to be your servant. Whatever you want done, just let me know. Your servant, I'm here. I'm for you. And David said, the reason I feel like, God, you should answer my prayer is not because I'm the king of Israel, not because you love me, not because I'm your child, but because I'm your servant. And boy, did God answer David's prayer. Can you have that kind of prayer relationship with God? Can you go to God like David and say, God, I'm your servant. Tell me what to do. I, I want to do whatever you want. By the way, in order for me to be your servant, there's some things I need help with. And I'm asking you to help me. Oh, watch your prayer life get transformed when you pray because you're God's servant, not because of any other reason. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be in church this morning. Thank you for every person that took time to come to church today. Lord, I sure do love them, and I hope everybody received a blessing for coming today. And Lord, I, I pray now at this time that you'll minister to our hearts and help us to make decisions that you want us to make for your honor and your glory. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. It's not time to leave. It's time for you to make a decision for the Lord. But, but please do not be embarrassed. Nobody's looking but God and me. How many of you this morning, you're sitting here, you'd say, Preacher, God clearly spoke to my heart specifically about one or more of those nine points. There's something specific that God gave to me, and I'd like you to pray for me about it. Would you raise your hand? Preacher, pray for me. God clearly spoke to my heart. Oh, many tender-hearted people, you can lower your hands. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. And uh, when we do, if you need to come to the altar and pray, we'd love to have you come and pray. You can pray in your pew, of course. How many of you are here this morning? You're a child or a teenager or an adult. And you'd simply say, Pastor, if I died today, I know for sure, according to the Bible, that I am saved and that I will be in heaven. God will let me go. I'm saved and I know it. Would you raise your hand? Preacher, I'm saved and I know it. All right, you can lower your hands. Maybe you couldn't raise your hands just now. And I appreciate your honesty. Nobody ever gets saved ever until they first admit they need to be if you do not know for sure that you're saved i would love to pray for you about that i really would i'm not going to embarrass you i just want to pray for you if you're here this morning you're a child or a teenager or an adult and you would simply say pastor i'll be honest with you i'll be honest with god if i died today I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to be. I really want to be sure. Would you pray for me about it? Would you lift up your hand? Preacher, pray for me. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. Heavenly Father, thank you for every person who came to church this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. Thank you for helping us when we need your help. 
Lord, I want my prayer life to matter. And I want the prayer life of everyone here to matter. If we can all be like David and simply say, Lord, I'm your servant. Would you, I, need, I need your help because I, I want to serve you. And I'm asking you for all these things, not just for my own personal benefit, but because I want to serve you. So, Lord, please help all of our prayer lives to be what it ought to be. And then for anybody here that needs to be saved or anybody here that needs to be baptized, please, Lord, help them to make those important decisions today. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? The pianists will begin to play. If God spoke to your heart, if you'd like to come to an old-fashioned altar and pray, you come at this time. Heads.